So without further ado, allow me to introduce Joe Jankowski. Oops, Joe didn't misspelled that one. Sorry about that. And Ralph Vesemi. Ralph Vesemi is the executive director of WCMA, and Joe is their is the president. And I'm going to uh, welcome them all. I'm going to turn the presentation over to Joe. Welcome, Joe and Ralph. Thank you, Deb. Good morning, and thank you everybody for. Uh... Uh, coming on today, and uh, I want to have a special uh, recognition actually for the uh, opportunity, uh, the, w the WFCP, and especially for uh, Deb Barrett, who has uh, done a great job in organizing us. So thank you very much for that. Um, I am just going to fix up my screen here in a minute, and uh, I will be right with you here as soon as I can minimize this one Okay, off we go. Uh, regardless of what language you speak, uh, child safety has become now a worldwide issue. Uh, if you scan uh, the Internet or go to newspapers in the United Kingdom, uh, not often uh, you'd see stories about child safety. It happens in Brazil, uh, it's happening in Australia, and it's happening throughout Europe. Child safety with regard to corded window coverings has clearly become a worldwide issue. In the United States, we have the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which has been set up to protect the public from unreasonable risk of injury or death, and they are in charge of thousands of consumer products. They have recently uh, published a comment that said that the, w, that the uh, CPSC has identified window coverings with cords as one of the tie, top five hidden hazards in the home today. Say so Joe. the industry uh, has galvanized an approach to try to resolve the issue and, and deal with it, and it's a three-pronged approach. Joe. First one is to develop stricter product standards for new product production. Two, to conduct public awareness and education for consumers and the trade. And third, to develop and distribute retrofit kits for consumers who are unable to purchase brand new products. Joe? Let's talk about who the industry is and what they're made of. Yeah? Uh, do you, uh, you know what? Just click on your screen because I'm not seeing a viewer and some people are not seeing your, your presentation. All right. I'm sorry. There we go. How was that? Gotcha. Now, the screen I'm seeing right now is Window Covering Manufacturers Association is the title. We're good okay, to go. I apologize Thanks. for that. Uh... No problem. Sometimes it's a technical thing. Thanks. Okay, just uh, a little uh, a background here. The Window Covering Manufacturing Association is, ma is made up of 42 member companies. Uh, the primary purpose of the organization is to develop standards and work with ANSI, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, we're actually doing other things. Uh, there is an initiative going on right now where the uh, WCMA is working directly with the Department of Energy to develop energy rating systems for window coverings. Our hope is someday we can have an energy star rating system that is like uh, used in other appliances and other consumer products and applying that to window coverings. The WCMA is also involved in innovation awards to recognize the innovation and technical advances of the industry. We have a website, the WCMA website is at wcmanet.org. Uh, there is a lot of information on there, and one thing in particular that I'd like to draw your attention to is there's a button for standards, and if you click on that button, uh, you can view the brand new standard uh, that has just been released uh, in a read-only mode, so you can uh, see everything there is to see without purchasing it, or if you uh, want a copy, it's there for, uh, for, for purchase. The ANSI uh, group was the American National Standards Institute. And they are a group that coordinates, monitors, and has a process to make sure that requirements uh, for uh, product standards are met. Uh, today there's over 9,500 standards that they are involved in, uh, not unlike the UL group uh, who manages electrical uh, products. There is a group called the Window Covering Safety Council, and it is a coalition of 41 manufacturers, retailers, and importers, and local workrooms. And this group is primarily set up to increase the education and awareness uh, at consumer and trade levels of the window covering safety issue. 
and they are the group as well who are producing uh, the retrofit kits for distribution to consumers free of charge. The website is windowcoverings.org and it's a great resource for you. There's a lot of uh, interesting stories and uh, videos and uh, other helpful hints that uh, might help you along. The WCSC also has a Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash window coverings and there is a, a lot of good uh, information on that as well. Uh, timely stories, some uh, videos, some uh, pictor pictograms and also we have partnerships with things like Safe Kids to again just keep this uh, awareness issue going on a wider level, a wider level as possible. A lot of things are going on at the WCSC in addition to the website and Facebook page. We're running Twitter parties. We do blogger outreach. Uh, we have safety stories that we've created and placed in many, many magazines and, and uh, uh, media outlets so that uh, the word can be amplified. And uh, this all accumulates on uh, what we celebrate every year uh, in October, which is National Window Covering Safety Month. Uh, but at this point, we believe that uh, 12 months a year is Window Covering Safety Month. By the way, I'd like to remind everyone that the National Window Covering Safety Month is co-sponsored by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, so we're in partnership with them uh, during this important month. There's some new initiatives that are being uh, worked on right now for 2013. We have a test program going on right now with CASA, which is Court Appointed Special Advocates, which uh, have people going into homes of uh, families and we are doing some window covering inspection there. We're actually uh, doing some testing with daycare centers. We have members that are uh, donating product to daycare centers and we're also working with the uh, American Society of Home Inspectors with the effort of getting window coverings as part of the checkoff list when homes are uh, changing, uh, changing out to new ownership so we can bring attention to the window coverings that are in the home at that time. Other groups like Parents for Window Blind Safety and the Consumer Federation of America are out there also amplifying the, the word and uh, we encourage all of that because in fact we all have one common goal and that is to keep this little guy as safe as possible. And uh, that's what we're all working towards. So uh, we're here to talk about the standard and the question is so what does it mean to me and what are the changes that are, uh, that are important uh, to consider there is a standard currently, but that will be uh, replaced by this new one, and I thought we'd go through. We've already had some questions in advance, but we'd take it uh, on a question-by-question -question basis to uh, make it easy to understand, and I'll pose the first question to Ralph Asami. So, Ralph, what does the standard do, really? What is it for? Well, the, the standard covers ported window covering products. It sets design and performance requirements uh, for all products that are manufactured, distributed, or sold in the United States. So this is for all products, all products, all categories. Uh, you know, specifically what products are involved in? Yeah, uh, corded window covering products including blinds, shades, shutters, curtains, curtain rods, uh, drapes, drapery hardware. Anything with a cord? Anything with a cord. There's a question about the standard, Ralph. Is it uh, voluntary or mandatory? And what, could you explain what that means? The standard is a voluntary standard because it is developed under the voluntary consensus process. Uh, it means that the industry worked with various groups, uh, CPSC, um, industry experts, and others, under the auspices of the ANSI essential guidelines to develop the standard. Uh, but according to the CPSC, anyone making and selling window blinds must comply with the standard. Okay. Okay. Who needs to comply? All companies, regardless of size. Uh, so it, if you make one blind a year or you make a million blinds a year, everybody is covered under the same standard. Uh, and anyone who manufactures or distributes or sells window coverings in the U.S. Uh, must comply with the safety standard. Does that go for stock products as well as custom-made products, Ralph? Yes. It covers stock products. It covers custom products products and it covers whether you are a domestic manufacturer or a, a foreign manufacturer bringing product into the U.S. Okay. Who enforces the standard, Ralph? Well, that's a good question because uh, many, many times people think that, uh, that WCMA is involved. 
uh, in the enforcement, which they're not. WCMA is the accredited standard developing organization. So we facilitate the development of the standard. Uh, but the enforcement of the standard is done by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Okay. When does the new standard take effect? I know we have one now, but when does the new one go on? The, uh, the, the, the new edition, the, uh, the 2012 revision, uh, will go into uh, effect June 1st of this year, which means that uh, manufacturers must be in compliance uh, on or before that date. Okay. So we have a few months to prepare yeah. for it. So let's take a close look at the changes between uh, the old standard that we're living with today and the one that will be effective in June. One significant change is, that in, is just in the approach itself. Uh, the old approach, we like to call it a, a prescriptive standard, and the new approach is called a performance standard. And, it, and it's a significant difference between the approaches. Right. A, a prescriptive standard really tells you how to make a product. It's uh, it's the recipe to make a product. It tells you how it to be how it's to be constructed. Where a performance standard really sets out the criteria of what the product should do, how it should perform, giving uh, the producer a freedom uh, to accomplish that goal by various means. There's no one path to compliance. I'll give you an example here of a Roman shade in the prescriptive world, and this was a standard that was in effect a couple of years ago, but you remember that uh, we would tell you, or the standard would tell you, that the cord uh, uh, should be two inches from the edge at least, and the ring-to-ring -ring spacing should not be more than eight inches apart, and we had to have uh, a weighted bottom rail. That was really telling you how to make a product. It was a prescriptive standard. That's been replaced by a performance standard. And really what this is, it's, a, uh, it, it's telling you what the product can and can't do. So in the case of a Roman shade, it tells you that the cord on the back side of the blind, if pulled out with five pounds of force, should not be able to create a loop that is at minimal 16.9 inches in circumference. And that is the typical size of a, of a child's head, and as the head probe goes through that, that will determine whether or not that product is safe. Yeah, so in, in, in looking at it, obviously the issue on a Roman shade, and we, we picked this, but there are, there are other products where it applies, but the issue on a Roman shade is the, uh, is the uh, accessible cord uh, on the back. And so if the product has cords or if the product has an accessible cord, uh, then uh, it needs to uh, not be able to prevent, to, to create a hazardous loop. And a hazardous loop is defined as one that a 16.9 inch uh, head probe uh, can fit through. So let's see a couple of examples. Since the performance standard has been in play, uh, the industry has responded. Uh, there have been brand new products and innovation that has uh, really taken hold. Uh, there are now Roman shades that are driven by roller shades that require no cords at all. Uh, we've seen Roman shades combined with other products like honeycomb shades to drive it up and down and, you know, uh, again, eliminate the need for cords on their backside. Um, another way to handle this would be to create a shade with a liner or a backing to make the cords in the back inaccessible. There's been uh, use of shrouded uh, cords, which are a cord in a cord that you can touch it, but you can't create a loop that is 16.9 inches. It just won't allow that to happen. So uh, it's, a, it's a, a cord that is inaccessible. There's been cordless operating Roman shades on, on the market now, and uh, Roman shades that use side channels, again, without the need of cords. So here's a great example of how a performance standard has you know, energized the industry. There is tremendous innovation, and we expect a lot more of it going down the road where we can find new pathways to, uh, to create safer products. And so this is why this uh, performance standard has been embraced. It really does spur innovation, and it gives every producer a variety of ways uh, to be in compliance. Ralph, does the standard require laboratory testing? This has been a big, uh, big question out there. You know, do we need to? Re is it required that we go to a third party to have our products tested? There is no requirement in the standard for third party testing uh, at a lab. However, uh, producers must be able to demonstrate that their products are compliant with the standard. 
So how the producer chooses to do that, whether it's by um, you know, test reports from their suppliers or, uh, or other mechanisms in, in, uh, in factory or in plant testing, um, uh, that's all possible, but there's no requirement uh, that you go to a third-party lab. Okay. Let's talk about testing a little more. What else can you tell us about that? Well, uh, obviously, this, this standard covers corded products. So completely cordless products uh, do not need to be tested. Um, products, and, and here's a, a, a distinction, uh, you can have cords within products, and some products that, that people uh, actually sell as cordless products do have uh, cords, but they're not accessible. They can't be reached, they can't be touched, they can't be pulled to form any kind of a loop. So products with inaccessible cords uh, need to be evaluated against the standard. Uh, which means, is the cord accessible or is it not? If it's inaccessible, you may not require any more testing than that. If it is accessible, then you need to go through the standard to the next levels of testing. Okay? What else? Okay. Well, uh, many times you'll have a product that has one or more uh, compliance methods. So for instance, uh, a Roman shade with a shroud or a liner on the back uh, and then a tension device to control a, a, a continuous loop cord on the front. Um, if you choose to use multiple compliance paths, each of those must be uh, in compliance with the standard. Um, the other question that comes up is, do I have to test every product I manufacture? Well, obviously, somebody who's making uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of products uh, a year doesn't have to test every one of those. But each different design has to be tested to make sure that it's in compliance. So if that million products is, uh, is divided among five different designs, each of those five designs will have to be tested to make sure that they are compliant uh, with the standard. And if there are questions about interpretation of the standard or of a test procedure, uh, manufacturers should contact a test lab for that in interpretation. Okay. Does the uh, issue of liability, you know, that's always uh, come up a lot lately, and uh, what is the, uh, how does the standard change liability if, if it does? Well, the standard doesn't. Uh, you know, any, any liability that uh, a manufacturer, a seller, a distributor, anybody in the chain might have is, uh, is not uh, in, impacted by the, uh, by the standard. Uh, the liability rests, uh, you know, where it always has rested in, and it's no different than when the standard was uh, originally adopted in 1996. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it's always been. Okay. Uh, what about warning labels? Are, are there any new requirements in this new version of the standard route that we need to know about? Yes, and, and probably the most significant change in terms, or addition, I should say, in terms of warning uh, labels is that this warning label that you're, you're seeing now uh, is required to be on the outside of stock packaging so that someone walking into a, uh, to a store and picking up a, a package with a, with a corded window covering in it will see this on the outside of the package. Uh, it'll, it'll talk about that the, uh, the cords may pose a strangulation hazard, and for child safety, consider using cordless alternatives or products with inaccessible cords. And the pictograms have been selected specifically by warnings experts to, uh, to match the, uh, the statements. Now, for those that make custom products, then the, uh, the requirement that this warning uh, be on uh, your merchandising materials, either your order form, your websites, your, your, your measure sheets, but something uh, so that uh, the uh, consumer sees it prior to their, their purchasing decision. We want the consumer to make an informed decision. So it's getting a warning out in front of the purchase versus waiting till you get home and then opening up the box and Absolutely. realizing what you have. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Ralph and Joke, I have a, a quick clarification, if I might, before we move on. Yeah. Yes. Um, the question is, um, when you say on the outside of a box, does that mean stock products only, or would that be stock and custom products? And then does that mean front of the box, side of the box? Are we being that specific? No, the standard, the standard calls for, um, you know, which, if, if the product is in a box, 
then the label has to be on the box. It doesn't say where. It just says it needs to be conspicuous. And there's, and there's uh, measurements that go along with it. But that would be for a stock product box. Understand what the purpose of this is, is to notify the consumer in advance of the purchase. Mm -hmm. So in a stock line situation where there's a stock, where there's a number of products on the shelf, and the consumer's making a choice, she pulls the box and she could see the warning label before she pr uh, purchases the product. Mm -hmm. In a custom blind situation, that, bl that blind's already been bought. So it's already in a box. The purchase decision has already been made. So there's no requirement to put this label on a custom uh, box because it's already past the purchase uh, point. Got it. That's and why when in you... the custom... Go ahead. That's Sorry. why in the custom side of it, we're asking uh, producers uh, to, to put this warning label in places where a consumer might see it as she's making the decision to buy the product. And Good. Up and to the person. Yes, Deb. So that's like drapery hardware. Let's say I go into a store and I've got boxes of uh, Travis rods. I need to see this warning label on a Travis rod box, correct? Yes, yes, or yes, or a uh, or some kind of a stock uh, corded uh, you know window covering. It would be on that box. Great. And then another question I have is, what about stock products that are sold online through websites? Uh, well, again, things that are sold online through websites will need to have it either on the website or when the uh, at the before the point of the consumer purchasing the product. Got it. The whole purpose is here to get out in front of the purchase decision so that the consumer is making a well-informed decision before she puts the money down. And uh, on, in a case of a, of, a, of a website, there'll be a place for, the, uh, for that warning to be visible to the consumer prior to the purchase. Great. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I thought rather than going back at the end, sometimes it, it makes it clearer when we're, when we're addressing it as we're talking about it. No problem, Deb. Good questions. Uh, how about bottom rail labels, Ralph? Are there any changes in the bottom rail label situation? Uh, yes, there, uh, there, there are, Joe. And, and, and really, again, you can look. Uh, in the past, we've used uh, on the bottom rail a, uh, uh, a picture of a hand or a, a, a child trying to reach for a cord. Uh, the feedback that we had received was that that really doesn't um, uh, from the Consumer Product Safety Commission is that, that really didn't uh, lay out uh, clearly enough the, the hazard. Uh, and so we have replaced those, uh, those uh, old pictograms with these pictograms that show uh, more clearly, uh, you know, a cord, uh, you know, engaging with the child. A lot more uh, understanding of what the issues really are. How about warning tags that are hanging off the... Uh, Yes, uh, we've added uh, we've added a, a, a warning tag for uh, Roman shades, and we've added a warning uh, tag for roll-up shades. Uh, these two tags now are specific to those products. Okay. Uh, how about uh, other requirements with regard to labeling? Is there anything that we have to be concerned about? There are. There is one other one, and it's not new. This has been in here, but most a lot of people may not know it. And that is that there needs to be uh, a, a permanent product origin label that uh, identifies the, the, the name, the, the city, the state of the, uh, of the manufacturer or importer or distributor or fabricator or seller and the year of the manufacturer. And that is something that it's, uh, th 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 there doesn't need to be a label by each of these, but there needs to be a label that, uh, that uh, uh, re reveals the, uh, the product origin. So just w one of these people need to have a label on it, right? Yeah. So there's not multiple labels on the uh, product. No. Okay, so just and again for clarification for those small independent workrooms that are fabricating corded window products, they need to have um, a product origin label before they leave the workroom. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. And is, are there templatings for that? Is there a certain way to do it? Or they can just, as long as it has the information that's stated on the slide, they can put it anywhere yeah. or um, in any, fo um, any form? Yes. They, as long, as long, yeah, most people, uh, I, could, I could say from, from, uh, from history, most people have that somewhere up in the head rail. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, it's, up to, it's their, uh, their choice where they, uh, they need to have that. 
And, and one other quick question back to the bottom rail that, that um, seems to be coming up really. The bottom rail tag, does that apply to, again, to like a custom Roman where somebody's put a weighted or a weight bar or a roller shade that's been made in an independent workroom? Must they have those labels? Yes. Okay. And those labels are available, and we'll talk about that later, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about uh, continuous cord loops. And the picture to the left uh, really is showing you what was being produced years and years ago, uh, a free hanging weight uh, that is no longer acceptable. And the new hold down devices had been uh, required for uh, uh, adhering to the wall or the sill under tension. Uh, but have there been changes in this as well, Ralph? I mean, uh, we're doing other things with regard to the tension device now and the cord loop. Yes, there are additional requirements now on all safety devices, um, and we're looking at uh, improved durability. Uh, and these devices now, whether it be a, a tension device or, um, or some other uh, type of, uh, of safety device, need to go through uh, testing for ultraviolet uh, sta stability. Uh, the, the material has to go through impact resistance testing. Uh, on all tension devices, there will now be the inclusion of a fastener. Uh, the, the, the tension device needs to be attached uh, as part of the product and will render the product partially inoperable if it is uh, not installed uh, properly. There are two anchoring tests re relative to tension devices. One uh, covers a pull-out test from the wall or the floor and the other actually tests a pullout of the cord or bead chain from the tension device itself, uh, and there are enhanced installation instructions. Now, each manufacturer doesn't have to do this, these series of tests. This would be something that you would get, a, a manufacturer, a fabricator, a workroom would get from their uh, supplier. So if I'm a workroom and I'm buying uh, hold down devices from company ABC, then I would go to company ABC to get this verification that they're in compliance? Correct. Okay. And when, a question about uh, that is, with and, yeah. I'm sorry, so when you get into tension devices, and maybe yeah. you're covering this later, for those of, uh, as we talked earlier, Joe, about installers, particularly being the front line of, um, of um, uh, defense. Um, it is it behooves the, the installer must properly install this tension device correctly. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and, we're, and we'll we'll touch on that a little bit okay. more when we talk about even sample displays, Deb. Okay. Sorry, didn't mean to to jump ahead. Yeah. No, no, no but that's okay. very important. Good uh, question. It, it comes down to how it's, uh, it's actually part of the product. That's right. Not an optional feature. Wide lift fans, uh, they've uh, recently become uh, a part of our business. Uh, what can you tell us about? Well, um, uh, uh, when we got to the, uh, the issue of, um, uh, it actually started with, uh, with Roman shades, uh, but it's now been applied uh, a little bit more broadly, and that is uh, rather than using uh, cords to lift the product, uh, people were using either full uh, liners in the back or uh, certain types of, of, of wide lift bands uh, to raise the product. Uh, a, uh, a performance uh, test has been uh, added that will measure the, uh, the stiffness of the material and the, uh, and the minimum width that, the, uh, that the, the wide band must be in order for it not to be considered a cord. Okay, makes sense, pretty straightforward. Uh, what about roll-up style shades, Ralph? They've been uh, they've been around a long time. What what, what changes have been made to that? Well, in the uh, specifically in this revision of the standard, uh, roll-ups now must have breakaway devices at the head. The breakaway device must be tested as part of the product, uh, not uh, not just as a breakaway device, so that the the uh, the style of the product, the weight of the product, and all is taken into account. Uh, you know when the uh, when the product is tested. So it has to be tested as one unit. As one unit. Okay. Because of the weight differences of the materials used. Okay. You know, that's uh, it brings us to the point of who's making decisions about purchasing, and that's what this is all about, trying to get the information to the purchaser 
in advance because it's really adults, not children, who are buying window covering products, and we want to make sure that they're aware of the issue to make the right product choices for their lifestyle. Um, we believe, uh, as a member of the trade, that we have a responsibility to have a conversation about safety with each and every client that we come in contact with, regardless if we believe they have children at home or not. Oftentimes, grandma and grandpa bring the kids in on weekends. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an important uh, thing to talk about, uh, just like the doctor might uh, recommend you lay off some, uh, some foods because of your cholesterol. We have this, I think, professional obligation to make our, our client base understand what's happening. And it's also our responsibility to make sure that your displays, if you have a display system uh, in, uh, that consumers see, uh, that they are also in compliance with the standard. If you have a tension device on the unit that is not uh, a, a fastened to the wall, then we're doing a disservice to the customer. Her expectations are not being uh, properly set. And uh, so we encourage everyone to take a, a, you know, one hard look at your display system and make sure that they are also in compliance with the standard. And it will make the job a lot easier when uh, you have to install that hold down device in someone's nice walnut uh, molding. Uh, this, uh, this picture came from the Parents for Window Blind Safety website and it really says it all. It says that most customers you know, too many customers today are still unaware of the issue. If this is uh, happening in homes where cribs are placed in front of blinds and the cords are, uh, uh, you know, within reach, there is clearly, you know, the message hasn't been uh, gotten down there. So it's our responsibility to make sure that consumers are aware of what's happening. The problem is not necessarily on every new blind, but there is a lot of old product on the windows today, and that's the problem. And the good news is that the industry has developed a, a very large platform of, of products that will probably more appropriate for people with uh, children homes. Uh, there is a wide variety of cordless operating systems out there and I can tell you from a, a number of manufacturers we're working harder to get the sizes bigger uh, so that we're changing the style of the units themselves to make them more appropriate for heavier units which will make them more accessible to uh, you know wider windows. There are retractable cord systems available there are battery and, and uh, motorized units, and especially some of the battery-operated products are much more affordable than they have been in the past. Uh, there is a, a whole bunch of products with safety uh, wands that you pull across uh, without any cords, or at least they're tethered to the wands where you can operate them. Uh, and there are plenty of products that have no cords at all. Uh, there are plenty of shutter options. There are plenty of window shade options, and there are plenty of curtain options available that uh, preclude the need for cords. So we have plenty of options at our disposal to uh, give consumers. And the question is, are we uh, making any headway on all of this? And uh, we are. The uh, wanted to remind you once again that the window covering uh, safety website has got information that's available to you free of charge. You can download uh, a bunch of materials, both in English and Spanish, uh, to help you communicate to the consumer what's happening. And there are also the retrofit kits for those consumers who are either unable to buy it financially or they're in an apartment house that can't, uh, that they're, they're forced to stay with what they have. At least these uh, kits will help make the products that they do have safer. Uh, and we've done uh, over 400,000 of them for free, and it's uh, a continuing program. So again, you could have access to that as well. I guess, are we making progress, Ralph, uh, your comments on this? Well, um, what we've covered today is all part of a very serious effort to address this issue. It's a big challenge. The industry continues to put forth a big effort. Uh, well, progress is being made, but obviously, as you can see, more needs to, con to continue, and we need to continue the effort. That's right. Uh, we believe that one death is one too many. Uh, we're out there to get to a, a zero number. That's our goal. Uh, we're getting there slowly but surely. We need everyone in this, uh, on this call uh, to help us out. Uh, it's our cause, and uh, we're, we have to do it together. And uh, that's the purpose of this call. Uh, we will continue to provide uh, everyone with additional information. We're currently working on a standards at a glance document that will help everyone understand the, uh, the technical aspects of the standard in a much more, uh, I think, uh, 
conversational way, uh, making it easier to understand what is required and how to uh, go about being uh, in compliance with that. So we're working on that now, uh, and we will have that published uh, very shortly. So uh, uh, when we have opportunities to continue to uh, uh, bring this information to the trade, we will be more than happy to do so and uh, be happy to uh, continue to do this. If anyone out there wants to do additional uh, seminars, we'd be happy to, uh, to help out. And we actually talked to, to Deb earlier about an effort just for installers, which I think is a great idea. So we can go out and uh, give them some guidance and information. So with that, uh, that's what we have today. Uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, spending some time with us today. We hope we've uh, shed some light on some of these things. And uh, we'll continue to work hard to make sure that uh, you have what you need uh, to make this uh, industry a safer place. So uh, Deb, I'm going to flip it over to you for any other questions that you might have. Oh, we have loads. Um, I hope you have a few minutes that you can more you can spend with us so I can we can answer some of these questions for the people that are on the call. Um, okay. let, let's start back at um, the a compliance date of June 1st, 2013. Um, the question arises from several people. Does that mean everyone? To clarify, as of June 1st of this year, every manufacturer, distributor seller, installer must be in compliance with the standard, correct? That is the uh, manufacturing compliance date. Okay. For those that are manufacturing product, producing product, that's the date by which you must be in compliance with the standard. Okay, so if I'm a if I'm an independent workroom and I took an order in April and it's going to leave my workroom June fifteenth, I need to make sure that product is in compliance, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. And how does that date affect um, a seller, like a designer or a window covering pro, or um, in that regard? In terms of having product on the uh, on the shelf. Well, I. I I guess what I'm saying is, is because of the pipeline, somebody who's selling the product, the designer right now, I think is what their question is, is they need to start making sure that they're specifying and selling yes. product now so that it meets the June 1st manufacturing deadline. That's correct. If, if, yeah. if you're a designer or a, or, or a seller that do, does not produce product, then uh, it would be wise for you to go out and ask the vendor who you're buying from if the products that you're selling are in compliance with the new standard, you have every right to know that. And since that you're representing that product to the end user, it should be something you'd want to find out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. But Great. it would be up and to the producer of that product to, uh, to make sure. And if I'm installing products after the June 1st date, I need to make sure that the, the, the tensioning devices or, or whatever, that, that, that the shade is in compliance before I install it, correct? Uh, well, the, it would be hard for, a, honestly, I don't know if an installer could actually ascertain whether a product out of the box is in compliance, but yeah. their job is to install it properly, and uh, you need to install uh, the, the brackets and the hold down uh, because a car has four wheels and you can't let it go with three. So he has to uh, make sure that all well, the and, parts are in compliance. And Deb, let me clarify, we've, we've enhanced some of the requirements for a tension device but tension devices are supposed to be installed now. Correct. Yeah, that's right. not a new requirement. Yeah. Right, exactly. The tension devices should be installed now. As of June 1st, manufacturers will be complying with the enhanced features. Correct. Okay. That's right. When, when we dug into the data, we found some incidences were occurring on products that were broken uh, or not properly installed, and that's why we're addressing that issue. And then, um, okay, so the, the CPSC is the one who is, um, ad, um, well, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Com checking enforcing. compliance, I think one of your slides said. Yeah, they enforce the standard. Okay. Um, what, um, what are the penalties of noncompliance? Are there any? Um, they can require a stop sale. They can require a recall. Um, and uh, and they have uh, in the past they have held up product in containers uh, being shipped when they were found to be non-compliant. Okay. 
Okay. So, so they can they can in, uh, enforce certain regulatory me measures upon you as a as a manufacturer and or correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, w let's get then that gets us to labels. Um, warning label templates are they available? Do are they do we need to purchase them? Um, lots of questions about how they get copies of both bottom rails, warning labels, etc. The um, if they if they go to the standard, the templates uh, for the labels are outlined in the standard, uh, and then there are uh, companies that sell warning labels and and warning tags. Mm -hmm. Deb, for what it's worth, we'll try to get you the names of some of the more prominent producers, uh, yeah. and you can spread Perfect. the word out that way. Perfect, because I think what they're looking for is is digital files. For example, yeah. if they need to put it on a yeah. website, or some people are asking, right. do I need? I want to put it on my proposals, for example. So when she customers signing a custom contract. Yes. Yeah, some of the labels for bottom rails, for example, there's a certain font size that uh, you know you have to adhere to, and uh, you know so some of them are much more exacting than uh, than others, and for different purposes. But we'll get you the information. It's currently available for viewing today on the uh, WCMA site, and and we'll get who produces those. Perfect. And then the other question is is could you clarify for custom products, is it a requirement or just an option to place warning labels on sample decks? It's a um, an option. An option. Again, the, the, the spirit of that proviso is to make sure the consumers are understanding of the situation before they purchase. So in a stock blind situation, it's pretty straightforward. You put it on the box before you buy it. You can see it. You got you understand it. Uh -huh. In a custom uh, order situation, uh, there's a number of places where a consumer might you know uh, be able to see that. It could be on a website. It could be on a sample book. It could be on an order form. It could be on a piece of information, uh, some collateral at the point of sale. There are a number of places that you can have it, and. We're giving uh, the, the standard allows anyone to uh, pick the ones that they feel is the most appropriate for the purpose of just getting the consumer understanding of the issue before she purchases the product. So that's you know gives it gives you a lot of options there. And and so um, warning labels. So basically, typically there's three total labels on each product is the question. So so I've got a label on the outside. I've got I possibly have a bottom rail label and then I have a hang tag label. Uh, two out of the three in the cust if you're talking custom blinds now, right? right. Custom ordered product. There is no need for a carton label. Correct. Why? Well, the products have already been purchased. The consumer already paid for it. It's 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 after the fact. Mm -hmm. Got it. So there's no requirement to put a label on the box for custom ordered products. Right. But I think but you'd this want really... to do it in. Go ahead. You'd want to do it in a place where they can see, you know, on the bottom rail label and the hang tag, yes, because they need to be aware of that when the products are installed. Right. So for workrooms, that means that if you're fabricating shades, you're going to have to put a bottom rail label somewhere on a weight bar, number one, and no, and you're going to put a product origin label on your head rail or somewhere also, as was was described, and then and um, then correct me if I'm wrong. That also so speaks true. to the fact that um, if it's if you're selling custom products. You need to update some sort of your website, your proposals, whatever contracts, whatever materials you're giving that client that has those warning labels on it. So because that's the point of purchase. Correct. The, the yeah the the one the one uh, you know warning label that is designated for the outside of the box or the merchandising materials for custom products. Okay. So let's just review. I'm a workroom. Okay. Label number one, it's the origin label. I made the product I have to you know, put in uh, that I was the producer of the product. Number two, a bottom rail label. Number three, a hang tag off the cord. And number four, put a warning label in a place where it's visible to the consumer in advance of uh, the purchase, be it website, be it uh, at a point of sale, or a collateral material. Got it. 
All right. And then um, I don't know if you um, can address this maybe in a more generic or universal because I think maybe this might be something that that um, workrooms installers and sellers need to discuss with their um, business attorney. But if there was a non-compliance issue, um, who is who is responsible in that? And that kind of goes back to your liability shift question, Joe. Um, is it the manufacturer, the designer, the workroom, the installer, or all of the above when you're talking about liability um, shift? The um, I, I really think that you hit on it when you asked the question, and that is that's an individual issue that needs to be discussed between the. Uh, the, the the individuals and their and their attorneys to de, to determine you know what the uh, what their relationship is with each one of those in the chain um, you know typically uh, you know everybody's going to get brought in and then it gets sorted out and that's something that we really can't answer got it um, okay sorry I'm reading some of these questions so if a client does not want the tension device attached, and we run into this every day, is it acceptable to have them sign a waiver to remove liability? For example, like going into ceramic tile, for example. Um, I think that that's something that the the uh, workrooms, I mean, the, the manufacturer of the product or the seller of the product has to work that out with their own attorneys. Okay. But but I think what, uh, we get, what we we're get saying. That question. Go ahead. Yeah, we get that question all the time, and it's really not one that we can answer. And, and I know it probably frustrates people, but it, it really needs to have a uh, – it's an individual discussion with your own uh, business attorney. Right. And what it comes down to is, is how comfortable you as a business owner or seller and your attorney are with the waiver and the wording of the waiver and, you know, your protection in future liability, Correct. Exactly. And, you know, it's, a, it's how comfortable you are. It's a, exactly. It'll 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 depend on the business decision. I mean, from our standpoint, they need to be installed. I'll give you I'll give you a full a, a, something to think about. Uh, maybe maybe you feel comfortable with the current owner who purchased the product. Five years later, the owner moves. A new new family comes in. Didn't sign any waivers. What do mm -hmm. you do? Exactly. Exactly. That's, Transfer that's a liability. Reality. That's yeah. the reality. That, that's the reality is exactly. Um, so another question about, um, and, and, and again, but so that, that people can kind of understand what they maybe need to discuss with their, with their customer is that the question is, so do we need to tell our customers when they ask that these changes are mandatory so it kind of goes back to that whole voluntary versus mandatory the uh, fr from the standpoint of the CPSC compliance with the standard is required to sell product in the United States so there you go they're, they're under you have an obligation uh, right to do that now if there is pushback I mean again the options that uh, are available with different product styles uh, might be the best way out. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the consumer is really balking at, at installing something in ceramic, well, then you'd have to pro you know, create another product scenario that wouldn't uh, have that need. Exactly. And there are plenty of options. Uh, Ralph, could you address the interpretation as a standard from the standards point of view of what permanent means? Or have you not? I mean, is that part of the standard? Regards to labeling, you mean yeah. you mean the uh, the um, on the origin label? Um, I that's the only place or labels in general. The bottom rail label. Yeah, I, think, I don't I know. She just the asked. Only place that, the only place that we used permanent was in the uh, origin. Okay. Um, label, I think, and we have it. Uh, um, that was a requirement from uh, that CPSC has on consumer products. Uh, so I can I can get you some additional uh, information on that, Deb. Perfect. But you know, it's the, the permanent. Uh, it's intended not to be, you know, e removable or easily removable. Got it. Um. 
uh, Terry, um, resend your question. I'm not. It is. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. And then, um, what about cord locks? Where do they fall into the in in the the cords and cord lock scenario? The old school. Um, well, those those are still uh, the cord lock systems are still allowed with the uh, you know with the uh, with the uh, interior I mean inner cord uh, you know uh, uh, stops and 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 all those are uh, those are in the uh, those are covered in the standard as well. Okay, perfect. And also covered in the standard are things like shades and blinds that have, you know, two or more cord hanging cords that have been knotted together. That is not compliant, correct? Correct. Nathan, that is not compliant. Um, so, and the, a product that it would that with otherwise inaccessible lift cords, but loose hanging control cords, meaning not under a tension device, that would be out of compliance because it's one p p part of the, um, you address the idea that, you know, multiple devices or multiple testing for performance, correct? Yeah, in other words, clear. if you use multiple um, uh, pathways for compliance, then each of those has to be tested and compliant. Right. So a, a, a shroud on the back of a Roman shade and a hold down device are two things, two separate things, so they have to be uh, evaluated uh, individually. Right. Because I think what the question that what the question was leading to is is okay. So I made the I made the shade in compliance with shrouds or ladders or whatever it might be, but I didn't I didn't put the correct tension device on it. So I am technically out of compliance. Correct. All right. Um, and then, good question about um, installers getting the information. And I, and I think what we'll do is um, we're, we'll work on something for installers, because as Joe and Ralph pointed out, they certainly are the front line of, of defense here. But I guess, if I might, I would say to all of you that are selling, manufacturing, or distributing custom and or stock products that somebody is installing, um, it's, it also behooves you to make your installers aware of this. You've, you're hiring them as a subcontractor, so there's a business um, relationship here that you need to, you know, you're res you need to pass this information on in some shape or form. And Correct? Deb, we're going to do what we can to make sure, yes, and we'll yeah. do what we can to make sure we get some more information that's more, you know, targeted to those, to that group, so uh, we can we can offer up some information. Well, and that. And, and that's why uh, you know we we think that having displays uh, uh, in compliance is important because it sets the expectation of the consumer uh, that this is this is part of the product. This is how the product needs to be installed. So uh, when they went to the to the the store or the design center, they didn't see a tension device hanging freely, and now the installer goes into the house and is expecting to to anchor it and the consumer says oh wait a minute you know this is different than what I saw so we want to make sure that, the, that we're, we're, we're urging people to make sure that the displays are in compliance so that the expectation is set that when the installer goes in the in the home that it will be installed the same way that they saw it in the display uh -huh. um, great question can, here I, how does motorization fit in with the safety standard is, is it addressed specifically um, no, it, it's not addressed specifically, although it is a compliance, it's an obvious compliance pathway. Yeah, most, uh, you know, most motorized products, be it battery or, or hardwired, uh, the value of those products is they, they eliminate the need for traditional cord uh, operation, so it uh, kind of takes it off the, off the table. Good. Um, what about top-down, bottom-ups? Have that is are those addressed in the standard? Uh, top-down, bottom-up is addressed in the standard, as well as inner cords on wood blinds. I'm assuming. That's been yeah. That's yeah. been on the board for a long time. And, and that falls into the performance requirement of the fact that the loop can only be. Um, 
the specified circumference and um, and five pounds of weight of force? Well, yeah, it, it it explains it in the standard, but it's covered there that uh, you know the the you 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 shouldn't be able to uh, pull inner cords uh, to a point that they create a hazardous loop. Okay, so just a cut clarification um, from a comment: a braided pull cord with a cord cleat is considered compliant. This has not changed since the last standard. Is that correct? Uh, cord cleats are not part of the standard. standard. We, we the cord cleats are not part of the standard. So they are not compliant. No. Okay. Just making sure that um, everyone's understanding. And then, I, if if I might, I'm getting a lot of questions about um, from the custom side of shades, roller shades, and. Um, Roman shades, when we're talking about the bottom rail label, I think we, we automatically think of the bottom rail as, on hard products, you know, whether it be pleated shades or cellular shades or, or wood blinds. And a lot of times that bottom rail is hidden in a, in a skirted bottom, for example, or a rod pocket on yes. a roller shade. Um, in, in the new standard, um, does the bottom, the, so those hidden uh, weight bars, do they need to have um, labels on them? Not, not, no, it's got, the label has to be conspicuous, so it would have to go somewhere on the outside. You wouldn't put a label on a weighted bottom bar that then gets covered by, as you say, a skirt or some material. Uh -huh. And uh, and so, you know, it's got to be, uh, you know, the, the, this is not a, a new issue. This, this, can, this comes up, um, and, you know, manufacturers have found ways to, uh, incorporate that label onto the bottom of the product. Okay. But just for clarification for all those independent um, uh, custom workrooms that are out there, if I'm making a fabric Roman shade and I'm putting a weight bar in a skirted bottom that's covered with fabric, I need to have a bottom rail label on the back side of my shade. Is that correct? That's that's one way that people do it, yes. And it has to be permanently adhered, whether it's fabric glue or iron-on fusibles or in some way permanently attached. It can't be a, a, a punch-hold paper tag that can be removed. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks for the clarification. That there seems to be, again, I think custom workrooms were, in this case, a lot of them were unaware that that, that label had to be affixed. Whether the client likes it or not, it has to be there to right. be in compliance. Correct. Um, okay. Sorry. Give me a minute. I've, we're getting loads of questions, and and some of these questions will um, definitely address. Um, per okay. So let's. Ter Terrell has a question, and I just want to make sure that I'm not giving you guys misinformation. Um, Multi pull cords existing or exiting a screw eye or a cord lock with the cords braided up to two inches below the headrail is considered compliant or not? It's covered in the standard, Deb. I, I can't. In, okay. You know, I'm, I, I'm not the technical uh, expert to envision that, but multiple cords in different configurations are covered in the standard very explicitly. Okay. So, right. so what you're asking is that it's tied off and one cord uh, protrudes out from, uh, there's a, a stop ball at two inches from the headrail? Well, what he's saying is let's say I have a, a, Roman, I have a shade that's got four cords and they've braided those four cords together to create one single cord and the braid stops um, at least two inches below the headrail and then it's cord cleated off, well, whether it's cord cleated or not, it's a single cord hanging, that that would be considered compliant. That it wouldn't need a tension device. And, and, and I, you know what, Let, this is probably really specific, Terrell. You know, look at the, uh, and if you have more questions about that, you can email us and I'll forward this on to. Um, Just, we're hesitant to make a comment that it's yeah. good or bad. You know, I've seen a lot of different braided versions of things. And some of the braids are tight, some of them are loose. Uh, you know, 
we just don't want to give out bad information. Right, exactly. And, and, and again, I think it's, 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 it's your call. If you're comfortable with that and you're fine with that and you feel you're in compliance and your attorney's fine with that, then, you know, it's, it's a performance requirement. If you're, you know, if you're in doubt, then err on the side of caution. Um, okay, so and that also goes for those of you that are sending questions in about your workroom making using cord cleats and and um, and nodding things off and that I would suggest you go to the website and you look at um, you look at the uh, standard and make sure that um, you're you know you feel comfortable with all this. And we will provide you with tension information. And again, the website, Joe, is for um, where they can view the, um, read the document w online. W, yeah, WCMANet.org. Okay. And then, again, from labeling from a product origin label? Yes. Um, only so what must be on that product origin label one or all it's, of the information it's, it's, uh, it's clearly laid out in a in the label section of the standard perfect there's only one you know if, if you're a, a producer and a seller and a, if there's only one label that needs to be on the product and usually it starts with the producer and that's where the the, the label 99 percent of the time is it, the guy who produces the product puts that label on it Right. I think the question is, is, is if I'm if I'm producing the product, do I then also need to put for you know for a designer or a seller, do, do both names be on it? And so you know I would no, direct. No, 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 no it doesn't. Just one, and you, just one. Yeah. Right. It, the, the spirit of that is to identify you know where it came from. Sure. Just like just like uh, f fashion labels in your apparel. Yeah. Right. All right. I'm just making sure. Sorry, just loads and loads and loads of questions, <laughs> which is great, great. I'm so excited. That means that people are, you know, putting this to heart and putting it on their radar screen. Good. Um, uh, okay, we Any? Okay, what product category? Again, all product categories, anything that has a cord. Yes. Um, for small workrooms, you would uh, suggest possibly that the first place that they would go, because there's like how to determine whether or not I'm, I'm in compliance or not, would be to read the, read the standard in the, on the website and then determine where you need to go from that, correct? Correct. Um, homeowners that sell their homes with non-compliant products after June, that, again, that's an attorney issue. We, we don't know how that's going to play out in the future, correct? That's specific. No, that, no this, this, standard, this standard addresses, uh, you know, new product production. It doesn't, the standard doesn't address what's in somebody's home currently. Mm -hmm. That that's why we have such a big awareness program. Okay, so I think and, and, and sorry to go back to this to this label thing, but everybody keeps I don't think they're understanding it. So they said at one point we said that the perm the only permanent label was the product of origin label, but th so does the bottom rail label need to also be permanent? It, it is supposed to be. Um, you know, on, on, for instance, it is a, it is a, a stick-on label in many cases where there is a, a bottom, uh, a, you know, a bottom bar. Uh -huh. um, you know, you use fabric glue. I mean, it's, uh, it, it uh, you know, I mean, the, the manufacturers generally um, have figured out for their types of products how they need to affix those labels. Okay. I guess the question, the, the the real issue is they're not intended to be removed. Got now, it. Now, okay, that's that's the whole thing. They're not intended to be removed. Right. 
Got it. And then um, in the standard, if they go to the website um, for drapery rods, um, are the types of tension pulleys for drapery rods um, included? So it, I guess when you were showing the slide, for example, that said that it had to be have certain enhanced features like UV stability and it had there was an anchor test for drywall and an anchor test for um, the cord actually coming out of the pulley that those compliance tests um, also um, include drapery cord rod cord any, any, yeah any of the safety de uh, uh, devices that's correct and anybody who produces those products uh, again have uh, have to be in compliance by June Right. So, so I guess for those for those of you that are at questioning that, your drapery rod manufacturers are obviously aware of all of this, and I'm assuming that they're working behind the scenes to um, make sure that the what they're packaging for you is in compliance. And um, as Joe pointed out. If you have any questions or doubts about it, then call your distributor and or your sales rep and ask those questions prior to June 1st. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think... I mean, it's, it's March. It's a good time to give them a call and see if they're working towards that. Especially because orders that, you know, people are starting to sell orders and then they're ordering something in March, let's say a drapery rod that's not going up for draperies till May or June, and, and then you're wondering, does it you know, is it going to comply or not? A um, couple of questions is also wood blind cords. Right now they're, you know, hanging free on cord tilts, for example. Um, is that still, um, is that still part of the uh, standard and um, are they considered compliant? They're covered by the standard. Yes, they're covered by the, by the current standard. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Well, I think we're good. I and what I'm going to do, guys, to, that are on this call, is I'm going to provide um, Joe and and um, and Ralph with all your questions because they've been great. Uh, we are right now. Um, haven't made a final decision how we're going to get this webinar to all of you. Um, we will within the next week let all of you that have been on this call uh, know how we're going to distribute it, this webinar um, once it's converted and edited and and um, we figure out the most cost of, or easiest way to to provide this information to you. Um, if any of you have any specific questions, please um, email me and I will forward them on to the WCMA. Again, I think it's a great um, opportunity to have that conversation with your business attorney on some of these liability questions that you've asked. And, you know, it's not necessarily our place, um, um, as Ralph pointed out, to, to be having that conversation personally with you, but but certainly, you know, make an appointment and spend an hour of your time because I think it's going to behoove us in the future. And um, again, the website where we you can see the read-only version is, Joe, again, if you would? WCMANet.org. And click on the window coverings button and what will come up yeah, well, is... You'll, you'll, see, you'll see a button that says uh, the standard. There's a uh, right on the home page. There's a little menu. Uh, go down, scroll down till you see the standard. Click on that, and it'll take you to the page. Perfect, perfect. I, I thank you both for um, putting this together today. It's really been informative, and um, I want to thank all of you on the call. Um, it's really been great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully pull some more of these together in the future. Um, as we move forward in the standard. Joe and Ralph, again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Deb, and thanks everyone who joined. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Bye.